And on behalf of your brothers and sisters and siblings in 60 or so churches in Metro Chicago, in Flint, in Des Moines, I bid you grace and peace. Your, your siblings in these other congregations thank God for you, for your doing ministry on their behalf in this neighborhood, in this community, in Hyde Park, and especially on this campus of the University of Chicago. You're doing ministry that they cannot do. And so they give thanks for your ministry. And I encourage you in all of your prayers to give thanks for their ministry as they confront uh, the task of bringing the kingdom of God into being in University Park, in Wakanda and Waukegan, in Flint, Michigan, in, in a, Flint, a Flint person here, in Des Moines, in Edgewater, all around this beautiful, glorious city and a couple others like it uh, who are doing ministry on your behalf in places where you cannot be every week. I uh, greet you and bid you a happy new year. Um, it, it's, it's not quite the new year we wanted or hoped for, and yet here we are. Uh, still moving forward despite the pandemic uh, that is also still on the move among us. But we're not the same place we were a year ago. No, we know how to do this now. This, uh, this uh, technological uh, array you have here uh, that you've worked on, that you've brought into being that allows for this kind of worship service is really wonderful. And it's a privilege for me to be here worshiping with you today. This church has long been a leading congregation in our region with creative leaders that you've raised up for many generations. You continue to raise up your clergy, your lay leaders, that have made a difference in the region and in the national denomination. And so I too give thanks for you and welcome the opportunity to be here with you and to preach for you today on the topic of immersion. Will you please join me in prayer? Amen. So I want to talk a little bit today about baptisms, and let me make it clear, I mean baptisms in sort of the Baptist way, adult baptisms, baptisms by immersion. I want to respect the dual denominational identity of this church, both American Baptist and United Congregationalist. I know many of you listening today are not Baptists, but I want to beg your indulgence. Uh, I want to ask you to sit with me for just a little bit in this Baptist tradition. Because as you know, in the Baptist tradition, we do baptism a little bit differently from most other Christians. We generally do not baptize infants. We link the ritual with the mature choice of faith and of repentance. Now, I have no uh, desire to invalidate infant baptisms. It, it means something different in a way, but it's still valid. I've performed them. I actually was baptized myself as an infant uh, when my parents belonged to a Methodist church. That baptism has a different way of symbolizing the way a young person is grafted onto the body of Christ. But for we Baptists, we prefer to emphasize the ritual in its connection with an adult choice and a commitment. And we generally baptize by immersion. And that's really what I want to talk today about. I don't want to get so uh, into the debate over who should be or can be baptized and who can't. I want to talk about the spectacle of the ritual itself. As I mentioned, I was baptized the first time as an infant by sprinkling. And I was also baptized in later as an adult. Now, Baptists, we tend to frown on that. We don't think, you know, baptisms are just something you hand out at the door. We get a little nervous about people who become sort of baptismal junkies that every six months they want to renew that, that charge of energy you get when you go through a process like that. But it was important to me as I was approaching my ministry to understand what the baptism by immersion meant. So I was ordained in uh, 1996 up in Evanston, but I wanted to honor my home church 
back in Michigan and the role they played in raising me up in calling me to faith and in calling me into ministry. And so I invented something I called a commissioning that we did in Michigan the week before my ordination here. And it included a baptism. I figured if I was going to minister in this tradition, I should probably experience what it's like. And for those of you who have had one of these may remember, first thing is it's messy, right? You, you wear this funny white robe and, and, and I'm here to tell you, it's important to remember to wear white undergarments under that funny white robe. And you go in, you, you, you walk down into the baptismal pool, hoping that the water is warm and everything starts to billow up and the minister says a few things and you're lucky if you remember it. And then you go backwards down into that water and you come up and you're just drenched and you're ugly. You're just out of the shower ugly and dripping and wiping off your eyes and, and, and you know, steadying yourself and, and my Lord, everyone seeing this and, and you, you walk up out of the stairs and there's a couple of very concerned people there, deacons, who want to make sure you don't slip and fall because you're slick, you're wet, and you're dripping all the way to that back room where you rush to put your clothes on, the nice church clothes you brought with you so that you can come back in for the rest of the service. It's messy. And you know, not for everyone, for me, it was a little embarrassing, I have to say. I perhaps am not alone among white intellectuals of having a way of keeping all that religion stuff a little bit at arm's length. Well, there's no way to keep a baptism at arm's length. Yeah, I had to admit it. All my friends were there. My family was there. Teachers, professors, people that had raised me up, people I respected, they were all there. And I had to admit to all of them in public before all of them that I really do go in for all that religion stuff. Literally, I went in for it. Up to my elbows, in with both feet, the whole kit and caboodle. For those of you who have never seen an adult baptism, let me urge you to seek one out. Because I'm here to tell you, it is messy. It's a little bit indiscreet. It's also the strangest, most impressive, and most spectacular ritual in all of Christianity. There's no way to witness a baptism by immersion without thinking something has happened here which is important. And maybe you even get splashed on a little bit yourself. That water travels, either metaphorically or literally. There's no way to avoid the importance of that moment. Now, so we Baptists like to believe that our baptism is modeled on Jesus's baptism. And that's why I'm talking about it today. The lectionary suggests for us today that the, 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 the celebration for today is the baptism of Jesus. And you heard it read, as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize with water, but one who is coming after is more powerful than I. And I'm not unworthy, I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit, with fire, and his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, and the chaff he will burn into an unquenchable fire. John the Baptist shows up offering a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. It's a baptism that is messianic in that he's proclaiming a new and a salvific moment of understanding of God's work in presence and embodiment in history. There's a new possibility of claiming the divine love for one's life. It's messianic and it's prophetic because he proclaims that the presence of God will purge injustice and burn it in that unquenchable in quenchable fire and gather us, his community, the, the creatures whom God loves, 
into that safe granary of injustice and equity and peace. John is telling the people to get ready for it is coming and lo, it is already at hand to get clean in spirit and yes, even to get clean in body for this new possibility. And then Jesus comes to John to ask for that very same baptism. He wants to be part of it. Now the other gospels, the way Luke tells this story is a little different from the other gospels. I want to Terry on that a minute. The other gospels worry about why Jesus, the greater, comes before John, the lesser, to submit to him for baptism. And so they make a deal out of that. Luke doesn't care about that. Luke is not concerned about that. He has other concerns. He says, now when all the people were baptized, when Jesus also had been baptized and and he was praying, then the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice comes from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And notice, Luke doesn't actually show that baptism. He doesn't say, oh, and then Jesus went into the water and came back out again. He says, when Jesus also had been baptized, he suggests that the baptism of Jesus points to some other immersions, some other things that Jesus is getting himself involved in, that he is, is, is becoming immersed in. These two other immersions, and that's really what, what I want to point to this morning, is the meaning of Jesus, his baptism, and then for us. So, so Luke shows Jesus being immersed in two ways. First, Jesus is immersed in prayer. Notice what it says. When Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended. Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is constantly praying. In Nazareth, when he's healing and teaching, he goes aside from time to time to pray. Before calling his disciples, he prays. He prays after feeding the 5,000. He prays in the garden just before his arrest. And he prays from the cross. And he prays here too, after his baptism. And that's the moment when God's spirit descends on him like a dove. Not just after the baptism, but after the baptism while he was praying. So Jesus is immersed in God. That's one of the things we see in this moment of his ministry. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. Jesus, his relationship with the divine is part of his incarnation. He's made flesh in the world, immersed in the divine, in the body, in this life, just like his baptism immersed him in that water. So Jesus is immersed in God. Second, Jesus is immersed in the community. Again, Luke tells the story a little differently from the other Gospels. In the other Gospels, when Jesus shows up to be baptized, it's a big deal for John, for his followers, for everyone present. The, the crowd parts and Jesus walks right up. In this Gospel, Jesus shows up and just gets in line like everyone else. Now, when all the people were baptized, it said, and when Jesus also had been baptized, it's almost like Jesus is at the end of the line, which is to say that he immersed himself in the community of people in that line, in the experiences of the people for whom he came. This is the incarnation. Jesus pitches his tent among us and lives like us. Jesus stands in our lines and immerses himself in our lives. He becomes like us so we can become like him. He immerses himself in humanity so we can learn to immerse ourselves in divinity after his example. It's a weird little message I have to confess to you preaching today, today when we're so disembodied, right? 
But this is the point is the, the, the brilliant creators of this technology co-creating with God new possibilities for community in our world that you are still immersed in this church community immersed in one another I can't see the sort of Brady Bunch opening scene uh, tiles of all your faces but you can see one another you're still present to one another in one another's lives we're still finding ways to immerse ourselves in one another and in our community as we immerse ourselves in the divine. As we move from Christmas, the acknowledgement of the radical metaphysical incarnation of God in the world, that is Christmas. We move to shift to a period, a season when we talk about Jesus, his life and his teaching as we are on that pilgrimage to Holy Week. But the journey is not biographical. We don't do this every year just to remind ourselves of the stories of Jesus's life. For us too, it's a spiritual pilgrimage. It is for us to walk with him, to immerse ourselves in his story and the story of him immersing himself in our lives. And it starts with his baptism. In this moment, we pause. What is my involvement? If Jesus became flesh, it was for the living of my life in my flesh. He came here immersed in God and immersed in the community. He came here to preach, to teach, to heal, steeped in prayer like in hot tea, immersed in prayer bodily and immersed in his people among us. And this is so that we, can understand ourselves likewise, immersed in the divine and immersed in the world. Oh yes, it's messy. Living the immersed life is messy. The, the former executive director of the American Baptist Home Mission Society, Dr. Aids and Wright Riggins always talks about walking wet in the world. You walk through life like someone who's just come out of the baptismal uh, uh, pool and you're dripping, you're wet, it's messy. And you look ugly in moments, sputtering and coughing and maybe even slipping a bit. And yes, maybe it's even a little bit embarrassing. Oh, you go in for that? You go in for that prayer stuff? You go in for that community stuff? You go in for that repentance and faith stuff? You go in for that trans, uh, transformation of the world and justice and equity. You go in for that stuff, really? Yes, because we are called to full immersion. The baptism of Jesus leads inexorably to the baptism of me in this world. That's my call for today, for myself and for all of you. And because Jesus is our model in baptism, we can see clearly the need for us too to be immersed in the community and to be immersed in God. Amen. Amen.